yeah. Look at them stockings. You did good this year, Shannon. You did good. 2020 as a whole, however, could have been less explosive, but eh. Let's not reminisce about what's going on outside and focus on what's going on inside this channel. The anime misfit channel kind, that is. Hello, internet. I'm Shannon and the aforementioned misfits of otakuism. And it's time for a reading of the 12 days of anime. A time to get down and dirty with your nostalgia and recall the most prominent sensations anime had to offer. At least for oneself. Being it's a full video this year, I really hope you'll watch all of the moments, but if you don't give two horse whackers about that, timestamps are provided in the description. Blah, 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 blah. Let's just get this show on the road before my propaganda brownies fry in the oven. Politics doesn't watch itself, you know. I'm going to talk about today are either from the winter or fall seasons and with good reason because 2020 sucked for anime there was just nothing to watch for the spring and summer so it makes sense that one of the most high profile titles would be about four dudes smacking brothels all night interspecies reviewers by many accounts was peak degeneracy it was a fun time for bros it was a fun time for bras it might as well have been rated E for internal entertainment if you were the appropriate age, of course. You see, as much as I want to laugh at the major controversies surrounding this anime or the depth of the potential funny dub we could have had, an anime for all ages this wasn't. Hmm, it's almost like a show about adults enjoying brothels and reviewing them for fellow patrons wouldn't be suitable for minors. Yeah, let's just instead be completely surprised at this fact and mark this anime as not suitable to our standards despite countless etchy anime on our roster. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I spit on degenerate scum. Well, at least hashtag animation is for everyone is trending right now. So maybe the uninformed could realize such a simple fact that you should look into a show thoroughly before deciding to blue ball your audience with that reaction. And don't get me started on anime lab shenanigans being all high and mighty with their version being near unwatchable. How am I supposed to enjoy Hyena Girl with a fade to black? Thankfully, Right Stuff has saved interspecies reviewers from legal limbo by promising to release an uncut Blu-ray. Thank you, Lord Almighty. In terms of other notes about the anime, as I've said all year in previous videos, between the world building and chill approach to sex and naughty banter, I like how accidentally inclusive interspecies reviewers came to be for being able to say, hey, Everyone is on some level a degenerate, and that's okay. Especially in the manga, which I highly recommend. Even after 2020, this anime will forever stain its glorious legacy on the anime community as the show that brought to light corporate hypocrisy with the powers of boobs and butts. And isn't that just a jolly good time in itself? This show caught me off guard and had me more confused on why it exists. Don't get me wrong, I like CG style anime and the animation is really nice here, uh, but I don't know if it helped the band's marketing much. I mean, obviously it did since I'm talking about the band now, but if you've already heard the band, then maybe it didn't help that much? I I'm not quite sure. Yeah, this is a group, by the way. ARP uh, Backstage, or ARP, I think in general, uh, is actually a... AR music group. I think Miku Hatsune, but I don't think it's quite the same. I, I didn't even know they existed until a few weeks ago when I started watching this for a later video, and I'm enamored in a strange way with these people. Like, and they give live concerts, apparently. The anime serves to flesh out the members' backstories in a less than catchy way. The moments from this show that stuck was basically the full CD performances. Like, I'm pretty sure it's motion tracking, which I think is really cool. It's rare for a show to have almost a full song performance as a scene, rather than just like a pan away or like clips that you use between the shots. Like, Gravitation did that, I believe. And that was, it was nice. They had the full song, or almost a full song, but this one actually did like full songs, like singing sometimes. Like, on stage, uncut, not pan away. 
And the singers are good. Like, I'm actually interested in listening to this band. I might have to find them on whatever I can, like, Spotify or otherwise. But in a relatively bland show, these moments of sparkle and shine do an excellent job at being eye candy and a dose of pizzazz. I might get a chance to rant on this show later, but for now I'll just say that it's pretty. And so are the guys. Most recently, I participated in the new oven-filled pastime of talking about anime none have heard of. Pause and Select's No Vid November was a call to action for every able-bodied anti-tuber to set aside our grinds for clicks, likes, and algorithmic appreciation to celebrate unspoken anime all for the sake of charity. Personally, I wish I got notice of the said event when the call to action was first announced because I was up in my comfy with other projects for the channel. Audio requests for Zenith Real Review and procrastinating on getting my braids did as you don't but overall it wasn't hard to jam in my schedule once I figured out what I wanted to talk about now during the interview session I kind of felt bad how everybody else chose an anime based on their heartfelt nostalgia oozing through their veins and here's me smacking the competition with an OVA I accidentally found like shaves YouTube channel and this is not a diss of shaves I was just looking for videos at something random one day and here comes raccoon face blown up my recommendation feeds I digress though. Making pink the subject of my video was but testing the waters as I'm trying to reimagine analysis videos. I mean, beyond the instructions I gave Lamp for basic editing, I am more and more striving to go beyond saying what I like about a work, but why I like that work. Anime misfit style. Don't get me wrong, I adore people like Beyond Ghibli, but formal reviews aren't my jib. Lee. I'm more comfortable leaning in a sillier fashion. Not completely a comedic one either because then you have some yahoos in the comments judging your comedic value with a fine tooth comb. They come off secondary to the well actually people in terms of annoyance for me. That reminds me, during my interview segment, a key critique to my video is how fast the editing was, and I'll admit, our policy for fun JPEGs and effects could be toned down a bit or compromised with a new angle of comedy. I have been wanting to try more dry British humor in my pieces because of how subtle the silliness could get, but that's maybe for another time. The point is, the pink video was my way of experimenting with a new avenue of anime spout nonsense in hopes of making content more efficient moving forward. Like the video was going to not do well without the event anyway, so it might as well have been a guinea pig for creative experimentation. Now I'ma be that person in the room when it comes to one aspect of this challenge. As a creator going into the event talking about anime that otherwise wouldn't be monetarily incentive to talk about, I was worried when December rolled around and the summary hadn't shown up until then. Because when you don't make money off your content, you at least want people to see and enjoy it. Heck, hating on it would be loads better than no one looking at it at all. This event will of course attract more smaller, obscure creators who could use any hustle given out to us. But that's pretty much the norm when it comes to collaborative events on Anitube. Not to say that it's overly a bad thing either, it's just something I'm pointing out. I'd welcome bigger creators to join us in these events anytime, but it's perfectly understandable if they have their own plans for the holiday in the works. My spill is getting too long for this stuff, so just note that I'm glad this event exists, I'm glad I participated, and I'm glad that I didn't pass out because, man, I was at my limit after 10 p.m. <sighs> if I'm getting sleepy so fast, maybe I am getting old. Chances are you got a bit of a jump from the ending episode of this show, and it's definitely notable, uh, but I'm going to talk about a smaller scene prior to that in, like, episode 8-ish? It's a moment where Fenico is trying to get Haida to officially say whether or not he will give up on Retsuko or not, telling him to list things he doesn't like about Retsuko, and all that kind of stuff. It's in the same space they've eaten before, it's in the same space many characters have uh, eaten before as co-workers, as friends, and even in the beginning of the show. It's been used so many times, but it's such a wonderful bookend, because it's been used before in sitcoms. People are in the same space as they were in the beginning of the show, but that's a heavier weight on the decision made in this one stomping ground they call home, or a familiar ground, so I think it's really cool. But he keeps going back to liking Retsuko, or not forgetting her, or trying to push her out of his thoughts. This scene, its tension, its uncertainty, is capped by Finico, almost crying and saying it wasn't supposed to end like this. Now, I know that's a minor line. I know this whole thing is just a minor scene of probably a repetitive joke about, you know, give up on the girl already. But to me, it pays homage to two seasons of struggle between the three leads in one sentence. It's a genuine emotional moment that tugs at your heart more than many others in this show, and it's excellent writing. 
Sure, it's melodramatic and cliché, but it's the same gut-punch moment flavor this show is known for. It's delightfully subtle here. It also provides a final push for Haida to act on his longtime pining for Retsuko. It's the first of the one-two combo that makes this show's climax what it is. Just wish the actual ending wasn't so abrupt. Originally, I was going to make a slot in the roundup for Yu-Gi-Oh! from Sorta Online Alicization because his unjust death for the sake of Alice harem shenanigans is a heel I'm willing to die on. But I feel my previous video on the topic did a proper job in that which you should go watch and check out. After this one, of course. And while I am being Shrimpy Shills McGee, Hey, did you know that for every person who subscribes to the Anime Misfit today, a lizard gets their college degree tuition for free? Got a pet iguana struggling to finish their term paper about the importance of fly farming? Well, make his cares less atrocious by giving a like and comment on this video, questioning our lizard academic overlords because everyone cares about a proper education. But nonetheless, we are here talking about Akudama Drive instead. Akadama Drive is the freshest anime hot off the anime presses at the time of writing this video. And once again, put faith in me that original anime can still make it in today's anime landscape. The show is so damn good, keeping me at the edge of my seat week after week. Now for granted, I thought episode 1, besides its fun action, character intros, and style, could have done better with the main protagonist swindler or ordinary girl if you want to be full of pulp. And yet, as time went on, I ate my own words as I couldn't believe a main character without a proper name could turn out to be one of the best characters I've watched all year. Following her through the thrills and chills of four psychopaths, a hot mailman, and hoodlum not only was entertaining, but mind-boggling. I mean, was she really an ordinary person slowly corrupting any bit of innocence she had left to be name-dropped at Akudama? Or was she really a swindler playing us all for fools with her big sister act? Which in all Rex respect was dope. Hashtag swindler best mom 2020, fight me. Currently, episode 12 airs in just about a few days, so I will be sad to see this beautiful tale studio Periot crafted go. But I can definitely say I enjoyed every second of this bloody good movie infused ride. Word for the rise though, please don't stick your dick in crazy, because you will only be giving yourself one hell of a medicated mind fuck. Let's set the scene. In a world where fairy magic is as real as the ammo you use in war, soldiers and fairies have bonded through either transplants of organs or otherwise magic to become super soldiers and fight other countries for whatever gain they seek. But now that the wars are over, their purpose is gone and they wander, seeking a new life or a new reason to live. Some of course have taken this in stride while others have fought the government and rose up in groups in order to fight with their fairy magic against those who have shunned them so wrongly. An organization is created to suppress these fairy magic crimes and you, the main character, have discovered an auction where one of these fairies is being trapped and sold for money. In this world of intrigue, magic, and loss, subtle plots and schemes going on, a dark theme and... Yeah, hello? It's Jojo, they wanna talk. Full disclosure, I know that there, this isn't the only time when a Jojo or reference has been done. Uh, the idea of stand has been around for a lot longer than just Jojo, I get that. But I think this is one of the examples where it does it quite well. Uh, now admittedly, this does take place in episode 1. I'm gonna admit the, the moment that struck me, yes, is in episode 1, but I think it's because the idea of the fairy looking like werewolf or demon stands is so well done and drawn here that I think that's why it works. Because Jojo stands, let's face it, most of them are like human-esque characters, but in this one, they just look really cool. Like, I can see this out of a Grimm's fairy tale, just like put into an anime, which I think that exists. Does that exist? But like I said, the moment that struck out for me was episode one. Uh, the main character discovers her own, uh, I'm going to call it a stand because let's face it, and she uses it to stop the conflict between her new bodyguard boss and her old friend, who is one of those like soldiers that wandering around trying to strike against the government. She stops both of them by heating, like superheating the Stan's hand, which also heats the hand of the person, of course, and says that she's standing up for not necessarily one side or the other, but she wants to know what's going on and why. I like that when a character asserts the situation and says, stop, you guys need to pause, and not just picks aside of either the old friend or the organization. So I think it's kind of cool that it shows that the character is not really one note. 
the rest of the show isn't necessarily too stand out with what it does, but I do appreciate the touch of like hardcore fantasy of this kind of thing to a Victorian steampunk setting. It's yeah, you see it now and again, but I think it has a good balance here. Toilet bound Hanako Kun broke me. It was my biggest emotional investment of the year anime-wise. I already began having an interest for the show from the trailer, but it wasn't until my podcast with the Kage Pro 24 that convinced me to deep dive into the anime and manga. Boy, I didn't think I'd feel so much. Normally, I would be frustrated in a character like Yashihiro Nene with their boy crazy antics or pure desire to be loved back in general. It's not like there's some wrenching backstory behind her desire, so why do I relate to this girl so badly? It's probably because the show does a great job at heightening the feelings presented before us. Maybe it's the art style, or maybe it's the way characters look at one another, but I felt that every emotion the characters displayed had impact. I personally feel it's hard to show doubt in anime without going over the top with all the effects, but every time my boy Hanako felt like Yashiro was getting closer to the truth about something, the faces to reflect his pain and complicated attitude was perfect. A gap between looking concerned and betrayed and scared, but nothing else in the anime could top the way the supernaturals express hopelessness. Episode 8 lodged the words NO in my mouth as I watched the spiraling tragedies of Mitsupa and his quest for a future. Just thinking about that episode chokes me up, goddammit. Of course, if the anime broke my surface levels of vibes and sobbing, lots of sobbing, the manga made a waterfall from my tears. Almost every arc after the events of the anime makes me cry as it asks questions about life after death or finding hope in the hopeless reality. Heck, Hanako might as well be pessimism with a smile, as many of the solutions could be chopped up as, Welp, looks like we hit a dead end. Time to rip one's hope to try something crazy that won't work and go with the option I know will work. And the sad part is, he tends to be the only one with an efficient plan. Sure, obviously the anime will want the viewer to sit around for a more greedy, yet hopeful outcome so everyone can be happy. But still, even still, it doesn't change the fact that Hanako is just a sillier Hachiman from Snafu. So, it's no wonder that by the end of an arc, I'm rooting for Yashihiro Nene to give that talk no jutsu about how everyone is going to be okay, because I want some happiness to become of these dead people. Let them rest in peace! Oh my god, I get the analogy. All in all, when I watch Toilet Bound Hanukokun, I cry like a baby. When I read Toilet Bound Hanukokun, I cry like a bigger baby. And when I listen to my favorite audiobooks on Audible, I don't do any of that. Because I lied. Like I would have an Audible subscription. They don't sponsor me. Hey, you know what sucks? Writing out an entire moment to record script-wise, and then finding out you forgot how to work, so you have to ad-lib it and hope you remember most of the details. Because that's what we're doing right now. Ha <laughs> ha This is from Show by Rock, and the moment is, uh, kind of cliche, but at the same time I find it very funny. So during the show, you have this evil CEO who looks like a giant blob in a suit, I, I don't know why, uh, and he corrupts the minds and uses the doubts and fears of the individuals in the show to turn them astray, and essentially turn the musicians from the proverbial good side to his sort of dark side. Kind of more of an angst side, really? It happens twice in the whole show. Hi. Once for the girl band and the guy band, or at least the main two bands of the show. Uh, the female band Plasmagica, one of the members, uh, really wants to find more fame than just the small gigs are doing, so while seeking that fame, she gets taken over by the evil force and wants to quit the band, but her friends bring her back with an emotional song to remind her that friendship is more important than fame and money, which, you know, kudos. While the boy band, the Walking Hot Topic reference, which, I mean, that's the best I can describe him at, but that's kind of on point, uh, gets upset over a hair on his head being out of place, and then gets depressed and then gets taken over to be angry and just leaves because 
he just wants to? He goes to sulk among the most like obvious helipads in the whole city. And how the boys get him back, you ask? Do they go up there and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk? Maybe they play a song too? The drummer steps up and punches him in the face really hard and knocks him over. And then they play the heartfelt song. See, that's where you got it wrong. Honestly, this moment's very cliche when it comes to the boys being boys kind of thing. But in a show like this, I actually appreciate the jarring moment. It exemplifies the difference between the two bands, the Plasmagica being a more subtle, more uh, emotional band, more on the small things in life, while the boys are being used for more action pieces or action scenes and used to reflect more major lessons in friendship. I think it really has a good balance between these two bands and it highlights the moments and why they're so different but also so alike. That being said, the show itself is quite slow, so moments like this do help to spice it up, but I think there needs to be more like it because the show's pacing doesn't quite strike a chord with me sometimes. Eh? Eh? Musical joke. Okay. Hollow Life English is my first real gateway into the land of VTubing. I've always known its existence from an otaku's point of view, but never invested my time into finding a waifu to support and wave my digital glow stick around like a jittering chipmunk. But Hollow English at face value? Damn that slaps! I love all the girls. Well, now I do as they've come into their own. When they debuted, I loved one of them, liked three of them, and went eh to Chicky Mc... Chicky Mc... Her. I give up saying her full name right now. So I thought this segment would be dedicated to comparing what I thought about these VTubers then compared to now. Capiche? Capiche. Now then, let's talk about Sherlock FOMO first. My Amelia impression then were at my second highest levels of aww yeah. I loved her voice. I liked how distinct she was. She focused more on puzzle games. She had the best debut stream of the five of them, hands down. And she felt the most relatable for my need of an idol who didn't squeak every syllable she made. Also, she was one of the two VTubers that I felt sounded the most Western? Okay, okay, I mean in the sense that, congrats, Hololive, you made professional VTubers in the West. Amelia was that dream scenario. So why don't I watch her as much as I thought I would? Well, I love watching her do chill games and puzzles. I also think she does well in collabs, but I guess I don't watch her as much because I personally don't care about her other types of streams. She's not bad in that aspect, it's just not my cup of tea. This is in complete opposite though to Phoenix Lady over here. When I first watched her, she just wasn't jiving with me. But I guess what I didn't see at the time was her innate potential to make varied content. Nowadays, I'm still not on the levels of simping for her, but I watch her way more now than I thought I would. I like her quirky personality, the way she makes shorter videos to hook me in sometimes. Out of all the Hololife English members, I think the talk show was the most innovative idea. I already was a target demographic for the layman language challenge guide to VTubing, so seeing her talk show bringing up Hollow Life stars from other regions was perfect, and I think only she of the English cast could have pulled it off. As cringy as it sounds, now that there's more content to be had with Kiara, I can easily see it blossom from the ashes of which it came. And that makes me happy. Ina is one I watch when I want some chill time. No big things going on in my life or busy, just some good old fashioned chill time. At the time of her debut, I had no good or bad things to say about her, probably because I then and still now feel that her content does well in a quiet utility that she brings. Her drawing streams, Minecraft streams, puzzle streams, squid octagal person is hella great to put on in the background. That's pretty much all I got from her, really. Mori, however, okay, okay, Mori is the other VTuber I mentioned when I meant a perfect Western VTuber. But in her case, she's unique enough to cater to that older crowd while still maintaining a level of chill that is more active than passive, if that makes any sense. I think I can confidently say as the person who makes the most content out of the five, that she's the most unique and potentially driven girl in Hollow Live English. Again, I think that's chalked up halfway because of her older appeal as well as her musical edge. Speaking of, I love her music. Granted, I wouldn't say I listen to it on loop, but my favorite track, Live Again, slaps like a mother trucker. Inherently, out of all of Hollow Life English, I think she's the one I could proudly say to the normie audience that I like. Until you talk about my girl, girl, because I pray on the ground and showcase my full stand ship for all degenerates to see. She was my favorite. 
my best and i never expected to like her out of the five she's so talented crossing the difficult roads of being a cute anime girl who speaks english and has perfected the arts like some karate kid master oh uh by the way it wasn't girls that made my love for her skyrocket i'm not that easily baited no 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 you want to know when in the debut i got hooked here oh uh, oh right on time once she became city pop shark i was done hung up gamed over my heart was hers and it didn't know how to contain it to this day she's the one i watch the most frequently and feel the most love for she's cute yet easy to listen to a total gamer and overall super talented shark I guess Harry Potter was right. The toothy fish wand chooses you and all that rigmarole. We should, though, probably move on before I degrade myself any further. This whole show is full of hits and misses, but it doesn't skimp on occasional shock value. Honestly, most of the show draws on a bit too long. It loses the tension it builds up too often, but keeps the atmosphere just uncomfortable or odd enough to keep you invested. The characters are not quite one note, but can come across as too simple sometimes. And that's what I thought about the main psychopath chick until this scene. Okay, that looks a bit anticlimactic now that I'm looking at it, but basically she ripped the head of the other main character off his body, and the only reason he isn't dying right now is because he is in costume form. Uh, if he had transformed back into human mode in this point, he would have literally died. So it's kind of an important scene uh, for both characters. Aside from the obvious demonic sister thing, the scene puts the, the female lead in her place. Up until now, she's been on a manipulative power trip using the other main character as a weapon, per se. But here she finds a person who is far, far more powerful than she anticipated. And after this defeat, she goes way out of her way to bring the male lead back to life. Okay, he's not dead. He's a sentient mascot costume, but he's like they're restoring him to into one piece because if they because if they did put his head back on and he reverted back to normal, he would have literally decapitated himself because his head was so they had to give a coin to an alien. This does, of course, spur the story on to his next point in the goal for the characters and oddly one of the more normal aspects of the show. But this also shows that the female lead is not all about herself, which is kind of humanizing for the role of the psychopathic lady that she is, even if she still manipulates throughout the entire show. It's not that the show is all that good, though, but at least gives her more of an angle of she has nuances versus she's in it just for herself just because she wants to control the, ma the other main character. Cool Powers of Monsters doesn't a quirky show make, but I at least appreciate where this show shines in the subtleties. Also wearing the giant sentient meat costume, you know, that's because that too. In a show where sentient and intelligent animals hunt and kill each other, a lion yakuza gets taken over by a deer, and a high school is a microcosm of the social tensions in Japan that was High School Musical, right? I'm not going crazy. They knew why this scene sticks out. There's a half of one episode where a chicken in this universe takes pride, like a lot of pride, in laying the best eggs for other students to eat, especially Legoshi, who noticeably enjoys egg sandwiches from said chicken's eggs. Then when these eggs aren't tasting as good, or at least the chicken thinks so, the chicken's quite troubled and takes it personally. And then she finds out that her eggs are being sold on a different day and is relieved when Legoshi enjoys the sandwiches again. Not only does this clash with the general tone of the show, but it highlights the oddities that can come from such a world of humanoid animals. It's definitely a comedic touch in a serious show that's always appreciated. And how they take so much time in developing little touches of the world that make even side characters like very serious and actually intent people, not just one-off characters, like the world seems more alive because people like this exist in that universe and they actually take that much pride in minor things like food prep and egg laying. I mean, if anime is to be believed, a decent chunk of people are into this. And I'm right there with you. Final moment of the video, and you know what that means! Time to get sentimental all up in this house. 
Last year, I made it a goal to get more social with my fellow AnnieTubers, not just for the benefit of my own channel, but for me as a person. In general, I felt confident that my personality was comfortable enough in an attempt to talk to people, but I can admit it's hard sometimes. I think this year I accomplished my previous goal of stepping foot in AnnieTube, but now I want to make it my goal to make everlasting friendships in AnnieTube. I don't want to force those types of things as they take time, and I might feel self-conscious of bothering people beyond collabs, but I got into AnnieTube because I'm lonely. And want to talk about my hobby with many people. Anyway though, I would like to spend this bit of time to talk about some AnnieTubers who I gotten to know a little bit and thank them for coloring my day. In no particular order, of course. Shaves! It's all thanks to you that I got into the AnnieTube server in the first place. We may have met on my podcast, but I'd like to talk to you about older anime and our similarities of wanting to spread awareness in AnnieTube. I am proud at how your editing style has made waves across the community, but I think I'm more proud of how you're becoming a living meme here the more you do AnnieTube Digest with your Hey, it's Shaves! It's people like you that are gonna make me like this 2020 timeline. Jack is boy, you're up next, and I gotta say you're easy to talk to. Fellow funny man and afternoon waifu cleaner, I think me and you started to become more involved whenever we played Among Us and how I really am bad at playing it. Even my longtime friends say I'm too sus not to be pinned the imposter. But in all seriousness, you bring this energy to the room that I like and you make me feel welcome into the community. Core, you on the other hand, I feel were always easy to talk to as well, but it wasn't until very recently where I think I got the courage to bring out other topics with just you when we conversate. I had no idea we had a love for cooking videos. That made me kind of happy to have such a jumping off point with you. And I never feel like I'm being annoying when I ask you stuff, so good on that. Jawburst, when you gave me that spiel about growing up, I highly appreciated the trust you put in me there, even if you may think it's no big deal. Sure, we're 20-somethings trying to not feel stuck in where we are and where we're trying to head. And understandably so, we just have to be patient, I guess. I can hold conversations with you that I normally cannot with others, but I think at the end of it all, as long as we both love anime, it doesn't matter what number we are. I mean, yeah, no shit, Sherlock, but I'm trying to have a moment here, so sue me. Hayden, I always appreciate how you're always that guy. The guy who will go off the grain if you really think differently than everyone else. Modern anime is in the eye of the otaku. You're a great reminder to cherish anime we already have watched instead of constantly chasing the new. Even if your opinion on the matter can be a bit abrasive. But in the end, I still like you for Finally, there's you, Koriwa Eden. I saved you for last because you have helped me immensely as a creator. Your critiques give me peace of mind that I can blow up with the right amount of hustle. My content isn't for everyone, and a lot of the time it just makes people go, what? But you help me remember that it's okay. As long as I talk about more popular topics from time to time. I've watched your content grow over the past year, and I'm proud to be your colleague in such regard. So thanks for always being that short tsundere we know and love with your legacy engulfed in 42 Hachiman plushies, that is. In conclusion, I knew I loved AnnieTube when I started making content for myself, but this year really showed me how much I love AnnieTube with the people I met within it. I can't guarantee that I'll be friends with everybody. Heck, I might even have fights with some people. But for at least the upcoming year, I hope to continue forging better friendships to help me soar far. Unless it puts into question my hatred for Kikyo, then we got some problems. 